All right. In this video, we're going to take a look at functions of several variables. This lecture goes along with section 4.1 of the OpenStax textbook, Calculus Volume 3. And we're going to try to find the domain of functions of several variables and graph them and find traces uh, for them. We're really just looking at functions of two variables here. Uh, though some of this stuff can be easily extended to functions of three or more variables. Here's an example of a function of two variables. And the idea you want to have in your head for the graph of these is a curved sheet loading in three space. The function equation usually have x and y as independent variables. And then z can be the dependent variable. And then so the domain is the xy plane or some subset of that. And then the range is the z-axis. Here's the official definition from the book for a function of two variables. You want to keep in mind that the input is a pair of numbers, right? As opposed to the functions you're first introduced to where the input is a single number. Now it's a pair of numbers. Uh, and the output is still a single number, just like a function of a single variable. Uh, and then you still have the property that every input only has one output, right? So you can't have one point go in and then have multiple z values coming out for the same input. That would be a function. Here's a quick review of some of the notation things we've seen for functions so far. Starting at the top from pre-calculus, a function of a single variable y equals f of x was the notation for the equation. And and then if you look at more advanced mathematical notation of the mapping, uh, you might say that f maps uh, the real numbers to the real numbers, which just means a single number goes in and a single number comes out. Now, in chapter three, before this, we looked at vector valued functions. Uh, for a two-dimensional vector, uh, we had r as a function of t, and it was composed of two component functions, uh, f and g were common uh, letters to use for the first and second component functions. And uh, the mapping then, uh, r mapped a single number of the input, which was t, uh, to a pair of numbers for the output, right? There was a number for f and a number for g, giving you a two-dimensional vector uh, or a size two vector uh, for the output. And very similarly, the three-dimensional vector r Add component functions, we just now have a third component function, h. And so there's still a single number going in, a uh, single real number, but what comes out is a triple of numbers, right? Three numbers, one for f, one for g, one for h. Uh, well, now we're covering functions of several variables, and uh, z is going to be thought of as a function of x and y. And so the mapping uh, takes a pair of numbers in and then puts out a single number. So you want to compare uh, the functions we're looking at now to those in chapter three and, and see how we've kind of reversed the mapping um, from a single number in to multiple numbers out to multiple numbers in and a single number out. We're going to talk about finding domain of these types of functions. So it's good to review the domain for some common functions with restricted domains from pre-calculus. So one through four have functions of a single variable. Uh, and then we have some uh, domains over here to match them with. So take a minute to match the function with its domain. And pause the recording if you need some time. All right, so the first function, uh, square root. Uh, square root function uh, only has a real output for non-negative values. So zero or positive numbers can, you can take the square root and get a real number. So that's usually the domain you work with and that corresponds to answer choice C. Uh, for number two, you've got a reciprocal square root. And so now zero is not okay because the square root of zero is zero, but you can't divide by zero. So the positive numbers are still good, but you can't use zero. Uh, and so you're just using strictly positive numbers, which would be answer choice D. Natural log is a lot like square root and in fact has the same domain as the reciprocal square root. So 
uh, natural log of a negative is going to be complex valued. And the natural log of zero is just undefined in the same way that division by zero might be thought of as undefined. So it's going to have the same domain as number two, which is D. And then the uh, last one, number four here, the reciprocal function, the only problem is division by zero, which happens when X is zero. So we just say that X can't equal zero, which is answer choice B. Uh, you should also be aware of the domain restrictions for trig functions, uh, like tangent and secant, cosecant, cotangent. So finding domain of a function of several variables is the set of all points x comma y uh, that you can put in and get a real value for z. So look for those same restrictions. Square roots are technically any even index root uh, or any exponent with an even denominator. Uh, fractions, because of division by zero, so fractions where the variables are in the denominator, uh, logarithms, and then those trig functions we mentioned. Uh, so here's an example of a domain of a function of two variables, g of x, y, and we want to find its domain. So what we're going to do is say, okay, which of these property, so which of these operations do I see? Uh, I see a square root. And so I want to remember that for square roots, the radicand or inside of the square root needs to be non-negative. So one way to find the domain is to take that radicand and to set it greater than or equal to zero. Uh, now, this is a, an inequality of two variables, so I can't solve for a single solution. Um, instead, what I get uh, is often a two-dimensional graph. Um, but rearranging this equation, uh, it does end up looking like the equation of a circle centered at the origin radius three. Uh, in fact, it's, it is that circle with that interior, making it a disk. Uh, centered at the origin radius three. And so you could graph that inequality as a circle and then you shade it in the interior. So all these points inside this circle and then on the boundary are what make up the domain of this function. Um, now you may wanna graph these things uh, in something like GeoGebra, 3D Grapher, there's a link here. And it's really easy to put these in. You just type in exactly the equation you would expect uh, into GeoGebra's 3D grapher, uh, and it will recognize it's the surface. And then you can rotate this around and kind of get a look at it uh, as a three-dimensional object. And then you realize, oh, well, this is just the top half of a sphere centered at the origin radius three, uh, which is correct. Um, if you were to take the equation of a sphere centered at the origin radius three, uh, which would be, we saw this in chapter two. Oops, Z squared equals nine. And then you just solve this for Z. Uh, you would get plus or minus square root. And so it's not a function unless you pick the principal or the negative square root. In this case, they pick the principal square root and that gives you the top half. If you pick the negative square root, you get the bottom half of this. So that is exactly what it is. Uh, we next wanna talk about level curves and you may be familiar with uh, level curves through the idea of a topographical map. Uh, topographical maps are used to convey information about uh, elevation changes and geography on a two-dimensional surface. Uh, and these closed concentric shapes that you see in the topographical maps, which are known as the contour lines, uh, these contour lines are equivalent to what we are going to refer to as level curves, uh, and that these lines represent points that have the same uh, height or altitude or elevation. Uh, this specifically is a contour map of Devil's Tower. And the Devil Tower National Monument is in uh, Wyoming. 
here's the official definition of a level curve. You just take your function of two variables and you set it equal to a constant, right? And every constant will give you a curve and the, so are all level curves. So we can easily find these uh, by just putting a constant in for z and then working with that equation, uh, it'll often result in a uh, two-dimensional graph uh, of a relation or some kind of curved line. Let's take that same function we were working with earlier, g of xy equals square root of 9 minus x squared minus y squared. Let's put in a constant here uh, on the left side for the output. And these are the set of level curves, right, for every value of c. Putting in a specific constant like 0 will give us a specific level curve. Uh, in this case, we get the circle. That is the boundary of the domain. Uh, if you put in c as 1 or 2, you will get smaller concentric circles um, because, of course, you know that outer circle is the biggest one. And so they're all going to be circles uh, they get smaller and smaller as C gets bigger. Uh, and then I think C equals three is the biggest that you could get. And that would actually be just a point in the middle. Uh, values of C that are bigger than three or less than zero won't result in a level curve. So, you know, you can't do it for every value of C, but uh, often we'll pick numbers like zero, one, or negative one uh, and find some level curves. And we can then get a two-dimensional graph that simulates the three-dimensional graph. So this was a really popular practice before we had good technology like GeoGebra to just instantly get a three-dimensional graph. Um, people would do this to get a better idea of what this shape was like. Now, another way we might want to look at these functions of several variables is a vertical trace instead of kind of slicing with a plane that's parallel to the xy plane, uh, the vertical trace would be uh, a plane parallel to the yz or xz planes. And what you do is instead of making z a constant, you make x or y a constant. So in the case of uh, traces parallel to the xz plane, uh, you would pick different y values. And we actually looked at this when we first did geometry in three dimensions that planes parallel to the xz plane were all of the form y equals a constant. And so if you just take that those constants for y and you put them in the equation, uh, then you'll get f as just a function of x. Uh, and then that would be these curves you see here. And so then you could just graph those uh, as a normal two-dimensional graph. For traces in the parallel to the yz plane, those are the form where x equals a constant. And so you would just take these constants for x, put them in the equation, and then you would get f as just a function of y. And you would get these graphs where those planes intersect with the surface. So we just pick us some values for x or y and put them in the equation. And it turns an equation of two variables into, or sorry, a function of two variables into a function of one variable. All right, uh, just a little recap to wrap things up. Uh, we saw earlier the advanced math notation for mappings um, for various functions that we've looked at before. And this is the new one. See if you can guess which of the mappings on the right goes along with this function of two variables. And so the correct answer is C. All right, the input is a pair of numbers. So we use R2 to represent uh, pairs of real numbers. And then it maps to a single real number because it has a single output C. And that'll do it for this lecture. This presentation by Matthew Watts contains images and text from Calculus Volume 3 by Jed Herman and G. Strange, CC by NCSA OpenStax.